When the circus came to town. This is a view that many of us are familiar with. The bottom of Star Hill has for many years been a rather nondescript junction, an access route to take you on your journey from Rochester to Strood or Rochester to Chatham. My name is Robert Flood and today I'd like to look at an area that was once known as Lark Hill and if the town planners in the 1920s had had their way, we may now well refer to as Rochester Circus. If we wind the clock back to the early 14th century, a man called Simon Potting was the MP for Rochester and the landlord of the Crown Pub at the bridge end of Rochester High Street. When he died, Simon left provision in his will for the building of a hospital for the people of Rochester who were suffering from leprosy or other diseases that caused poverty. The hospital was called St Catherine's and it was built in Eastgate on the High Street at the bottom of Star Hill outside of the main city to keep infectious disease away from the bulk of the population. St Catherine's was moved to the top of Star Hill in 1803 to be in a more airy situation. Today, the Rochester Gate Retirement Home on the junction of Star Hill and the High Street sits on the site of St Catherine's. Some of you will likely remember the site of St Catherine's as being the home to the biggest cinema in the area. The Majestic Cinema opened here in 1935. It was a single screen, 2000 seater, with a Compton organ, 50 cover cafe and Victor Sylvester dance studio. It was renamed the Gaumont in 1950 and cashed in on the rock and roll package tour boom with the likes of Bill Haley, Billy Fury and Gene Vincent playing here. Bought by the Rank organisation in 1962, it was renamed the Rochester Odeon and continued to be a performance venue as well as a cinema. The Rolling Stones, the Everly Brothers, Roy Orbis and Little Richard, Bo Diddley, Cliff Richard, Lulu, The Animals, The Hollies, in fact, almost anyone who was anyone in the 1960s pop world played here. In 1974, it was converted into a three-screen cinema, and as a youngster, I went regularly for my fill of Saturday morning pictures and James Bond. My brother watched Star Wars there over a dozen times. Sadly, attendances fell and the doors shut for good in October 1981. The building stood empty until 1987 when it was demolished to make way for the Rochester Gate retirement block. As interesting as the story of the Rochester Odeon is, it's the other side of the road that has a more colourful history. Before the junction of the High Street and Corporation Street was developed and widened in the 1970s, a huge pub called the Red Lion stood across the southbound carriageway. This map shows the site of the Red Lion on the junction of the High Street and Ironmonger Lane and we know from the local historian Edwin Harris that the Red Lion dates back to at least 1689 when a bylaw of the City of Rochester required that every householder from the Great Bridge to the Red Lion in Eastgate shall on very dark nights set forth a candle from six till eight o'clock for the benefit of their Majesty's liege people. The pub was rebuilt in 1905 while under the ownership of Charles Arcol of the Lion Brewery. This is the interior view around the time of the rebuild. The pub was demolished in 1978 to allow for the widening of Corporation Street. Immediately next door to the Red Lion was the funeral directors of Naylor and Sons. Naylor's are one of the best known local undertakers and their distinctive horse-drawn carriage features in many Rochester images. Next to Naylor's was the site of one of the area's largest dairies, that of Bourne and Hillier Creameries. William Hillier first moved to this site in 1911 having previously been based further into Rochester. Hillier was an ambitious businessman and in 1924 he bought the adjacent Medway Fruit Company as well as the Cathedral Creameries that were located at 66 High Street, Rochester. William Bourne ran a small dairy in Strood and he joined Hillier at the Star Hill site when they merged to form Bourne and Hillier in 1927. The company expanded along the High Street opposite St Margaret's Banks with its transport yard based at what's now known as Bourne Court. Here's part of its fleet of iconic milk floats, pictured not long before the company folded in 1994. Another building that many of you will remember was known as Nickleby Nuke. Standing at 203, this building survived many of the changes that happened in the area. 
Nickleby Nook was a Grade 2 listed residential structure that would have been representative of many of the buildings that stood in the area. It ended up in the ownership of the Bourne and Hillier Dairy and the plans for its demolition go back as far as 1976 as the dairy placed a greater value on the commercial value of the land than the building itself. As everything either side of it was demolished, the neglect of the building got the better of it and it was irreparably damaged during a gale in January 1990. Furrell's Wharf is particularly interesting. Named after coal merchant Frederick Furrell, the company's office stood where the now empty Rochester Motor Company building stands. Frederick Furrell Sr was Mayor of Rochester in 1855. Furrell's was a wooden office building built on the corner of the High Street and what was known as Winfield's Garden. Winfield's Market Garden extended from Medway Terrace to Furrell's Road and filled all the land from the High Street to the railway embankment. Furrell's office was knocked down and replaced in 1908 by a building that was the area's very own Siemens Mission an institute created to cater for the physical, moral and spiritual welfare of merchant seamen. It should be remembered that Rochester and Chatham were so important to merchant shipping that St Margaret's Banks housed consulates for the Swedish, Danish, Finnish and Dutch governments. The Siemens Institute building is for the most part still intact and is a fine piece of red brick Edwardian architecture. The title of this short film is When the Circus Came to Town but not just because of the Rochester Corporation's plan to call the Star Hill Junction Rochester Circus. The land behind what is now the Crown Court Dentist, as far as the railway embankment and stretching from Furrell's Road to Ironmonger Lane, across what is now Bardell Terrace, was also known 150 years ago as Furrell's Wharf, and this was used as a circus ground. James Sanger's circus was a regular, and latterly his two sons, John and George, were to turn the Sanger name into one of the greatest in British popular entertainment history. Lord George Sanger became synonymous with the circus. One of the brothers' popular shows was the pantomime Lady Godiva, featuring a well-known equestrian, Ellen Chapman. Ellen had been part of Wombwell's Menagerie, another show that would regularly appear at Furrell's Wharf. When she was with Wombwell's, Ellen became one of the first female lion tamers. She was known as Madame Pauline de Vere, the Lady of the Lions, and also as the Lion Queen, and she was hailed to be the first woman ever to put her head inside a lion's mouth. She performed her show for Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle in October 1847 and became a household name overnight. Wormwell's Menagerie is probably best known for the accident that happened in Chatham in 1849. Ellen Chapman's replacement as the Lion Queen was a 17-year-old called Ellen Blight. Ellen was killed by a tiger when she entered its cage to perform her act, the tiger attacking her in front of a startled audience. The story was so sensational that it made the front page of the London Illustrated News. By 1870, George Sanger's circus road train was two miles long and according to Maidstone Zoo founder Gerard Tewitt Drake, it consisted of at least 10 wagons to carry the tent and seating, a lamp wagon, 8 or 10 living carriages, a foal wagon, 10 wild beast wagons full of lions, tigers and bears, a harness wagon, a portable blacksmith's forge, property wagons, wardrobe and dressing cars, a band carriage and at least 6 great tableau cars for the parade. Other shows that would appear at Furrell's Wharf included Pinder's Circus, Edmund's Menagerie, Middleton's Marionettes and Richardson's Theatre. Local historian Edwin Harris describes the gala day of a circus arrival in his 1930s reminiscence called the Riverside. A circus began to arrive between 6 and 7 o'clock in the morning. First the poles, ropes and tents, then began the digging and banking up the circus ring raising the massive pole for the centre of the large tent, raising of the dressing tents and temporary stables, and building of rows of seats tier upon tier. This was followed by the grand midday procession, three tier triumphal cars on which would be seated several historic actors, often with the addition of a live lion or tiger. Horses and elephants, clowns and jesters would all join the procession to the circus site, followed by a band seated in a gilded carriage. Not only would the procession alert the public to the circus, 
but promotional stunts would take place in the local area, such as the one advertised by this poster from 1816, showing that stupendous animal, the male elephant, to be seen at the Star Inn Rochester, the sagacity of which justly terms him the learned or half-reasoning beast. And it wasn't just animals that were used to tempt people in. This poster for the anti-combustible man salamander, albeit for a performance at Cossack Field off the Dels in Rochester, was typical of the sort of spectacle the public could expect. Many of the pictures used in this film are from around the UK, and there don't appear to be any images of the circus in Rochester. Perhaps you may have some in your family collections. If you do, please get in touch with the Medway Archive Centre. I know they would love to add them to their collections. I hope you found this short film interesting and you'll look differently at the Star Hill Junction next time you pass through.